Habitats, Heroes, and Hallelujah, Stories of Hope from the North Carolina Coast. Presented by the North Carolina Coastal Federation and the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Welcome to Nikki's Restaurant on the Swansboro Waterfront. I'm Bland Simpson, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to be your guide on a journey to some extraordinary places along the North Carolina coast. We'll visit some of the brooding swamps that dominate the landscape of the Northeast coast. We'll take a trip down the beautiful White Oak River between Moorhead City and Jacksonville. And we'll walk along a secluded beach near South Carolina. Along the way, we'll meet some extraordinary people. We'll meet fishermen who help preserve some of the state's wildest areas, hundreds of volunteers who work every year to bring back a river, and the saviors of an island. Marshes, rivers, islands, all very different, but many of the places we'll visit are tied together by common threads. Most of them were threatened with development and were saved because thousands of ordinary people cared enough to save them. They banded together. They fought powerful economic and political forces. They persevered. And in the end, they won. The places they saved are now invaluable pieces of our coastal heritage. They're part of a legacy worth revisiting. Let's start up in the swamps, bordering Pamlico Sound. Each winter, about 65,000 tundra swans flock to North Carolina's northern coast. Here, the rivers, sounds, marshes, and farm fields provide abundant food and restful refuge. These wild and beautiful places have become integral parts of the migratory cycle for these magnificent birds. Watching them mass in the thousands is an awe-inspiring sight. But the scene could have been vastly different. Just west of the string of islands known as the Outer Banks is a broad peninsula bordered by the Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds. Here, brackish creeks course through dense wetlands and tangles of catbrier and evergreen shrubs. The Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds combine to make up the second largest estuary in the United States. It covers more than 9,000 miles of freshwater rivers and streams and over a million and a half acres of brackish estuarine waters. The black soils of the northern coastal plain are different from the soils of the central and southern coast. Here a thick brown hash of mud, muck, and decaying plants called peat covers hundreds of thousands of acres. It's the kind of wet, boggy place long thought to be worthless. But in the late 1970s, entrepreneurs found a way to wring some economic value out of the region's bogs. They wanted to strip the peat soils off the land and convert them to create methanol for fuel. In 1979, Peat and Methanol Associates announced plans to build a plant in Tyrrell County that could consume a half million tons of peat a year, producing 60 million gallons of methanol. If they had had their way, this would all have become ravaged wetlands, a vast, huge super farm, rather than a refuge for wildlife. This is David Kitts. He's the assistant manager of the Pocosin Lakes Refuge. David has been with the refuge system for more than 30 years, and he knows as much about this land as anyone. This is what once was ocean. Uh, the Suffolk Scarp, which is Highway 32 in Plymouth, was, was where the ocean was. As it started receding, then the peat started accumulating under the ocean floor. So you have this organic soil over mineral soil with the mineral either being sand or clay or a combination of sand and clay. Pete's ability to soak up rain, hold it like a sponge, and then release it slowly has protected the richness of the estuaries of Albemarle and Pamlico Sounds. Here, where the fresh water of rivers meets the edge of the salt sea, marine life abounds. The creeks, rivers, and bays within the sound are nursery areas for more than 75 species of fish and shellfish. These estuaries are the foundations for our commercial and recreational fishing industries. If the peat was removed from the land, polluted runoff would flood unchecked into the sounds. It would bring with it sediment, bacteria, and enough fresh water to kill young marine organisms. But opponents, including fishermen and conservation groups like the North Carolina Coastal Federation, successfully fought the peat miners 
and most of this land is now preserved in the Alligator River and Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuges. These refuges represent some of the wildest places in eastern North America. Todd Miller knew what strip mining would do to the fish, shrimp, and crabs. He's the founder and was then the only staff member of the new nonprofit group, the North Carolina Coastal Federation. The basic idea behind the Coastal Federation was to engage citizens in decisions about how the coast is managed. Um, growing up here, I realized that people really were concerned about water quality and the state of our fisheries, and many felt helpless to do much about it. So the Federation really provided a means for them to learn about how they could be involved and to voice their opinions. Miller began talking with fishermen in 1982. It would be the Federation's first real fight, and it would attract nationwide attention. The job we had before us was not really to educate people about what the problem was, it was to help them address the problem. And um, so, you know, some of the first things we did was really to first bring people up to speed on what the plans were for peat mining. Um, we didn't have to convince them that draining those wetlands was going to be an issue. Um, it, but they did need help in understanding how they could influence the permitting process and the state officials to watch out for their interest and not to watch out for the corporate interest. The peat mining proposal had the support of Governor James Hunt, and many people assumed it was a done deal. But fishermen like Willie Phillips wouldn't give up. A commercial crabber at the time of the peat proposal and now the owner of the Full Circle Crab Company just outside Columbia, Phillips helped Miller dig into state reports. They knew that runoff from drained wetlands would harm populations of young shrimp and other marine animals. The fecundity of the nurseries was um, one of legend, had been over time, and um, they had personally seen within their lifetimes the diminishment of that productivity uh, because of land-based activities. And this was one of the more negative aspects of that activity. Public meetings were held so residents could ask questions and learn more about the proposal. Willie Phillips attended the meetings and recalls one with vivid detail. I guess uh, Hilders Golden probably did it the best when he went to a public meeting and held up some water that came from uh, a ditch draining a peat project and um, asked if anyone wanted a drink or they wanted to put their goldfish in it and let it swim around and everyone uh, declined and it, it was very evident that nobody wanted that particular water coming in on top of them. The more they talked, the more obvious it became that peat mining would forever alter coastal landscapes and cause irreparable harm to North Carolina's fishing waters. The effort grew and thousands of fishermen and residents spoke out against the proposal. Probably 20% of the population of Hyde County at the time attending this meeting, you know, packing the gymnasium and really uh, having a chance to firsthand let their opinions be known you know, to the people in Raleigh. Without the needed permits, peat methanol associates and other mining interests in the area gave up on their projects. Their expansive holdings in the Albemarle Pamlico region became available to be preserved. The conservation fund eventually bought 93,000 acres south of Lake Phelps and in 1990 gave the land to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to create Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge. The refuge is one of 10 national refuges in North Carolina. It now covers 113,000 acres in three counties and provides habitat for migratory waterfowl and endangered and threatened species. The animals that use the Pocosin, it's really a wide variety of animals. Uh, you know, the black bear, everybody gets real excited seeing the black bear. Well, there was a study done here a few years back and the Pocosin had the highest density of black bears that was ever recorded in the literature. Um, it's just really a haven for wildlife. I mean, it, it, there's a tremendous variety and also numbers of species that use the Pocosins. The large, inaccessible tracts of Pocosin Lakes National Wildlife Refuge provide habitat for the only wild population of endangered red wolves in the world and the largest population of black bears east of the Mississippi River. About 63,000 people visit the refuge each year. 
It's open year round, but the best time to visit is in the cooler seasons to avoid the summer's heat and mosquitoes. A great place to begin your visit is at the Walter B. Jones Visitor Center in Columbia. Here, visitors are introduced to the beauty of the coastal sounds and sights of eastern North Carolina and can learn about the wildlife that roams the enormous natural areas of the refuge. The Scuppernong River Interpretive Boardwalk is a pleasant three-quarter mile loop trail that meanders along the river through a cypress swamp and leads into downtown Columbia. One local tells of her daily walks in early morning and late afternoon where she occasionally yields the right of way to a black bear. The river, lakes, and canals of the refuge are open to fishing and are prime spots for catfish, crappie, and sunfish. Canoeing, kayaking, and boating are popular along the river, and access is easy from the refuge headquarters. The refuge headquarters and visitor center have helped transform the little town of Columbia on the Scuppernong River in Tyrrell County into a center for ecotourism. Columbia is surrounded by thousands of acres of protected lands. In fact, 85% of the county is preserved land. Conservation, townspeople have found, is good for the arts, education, and business. This is Pocosin Arts. It's located on Main Street in the heart of Columbia. And that's Feather Phillips, Willie's wife. Here you can watch local artists at work or even take classes in pottery, carving, weaving, quilt making, or blacksmithing. The gift shop features handmade works of art and proceeds support local artists and the Pocosin Arts programs. Pocosin Arts has a wide range of activities. We have, uh, we're standing in our gallery, which is an education gallery and a sales gallery. And in the gallery, we interpret the folk art of the region. So we have some exhibits here which are displayed by culture. And so our mission is to look at the interface between culture and environment and how do people shape place and how does place shape culture. Since 1995, Pocosin Arts has held open their doors to residents and visitors. Here, the people of the Pocosins tell the stories of the Pocosin way of life through their art. As we, we develop cultures of sameness and um, we don't give respect to that, that local knowledge based on generations of living in the same place, we lose a tremendous amount of information that's important to survival. So I think that what's so exciting about this part of the world is the traditional culture is alive and working and active, and there's a lot to be learned from the people who have lived in this place for such a long time. Visitors will enjoy Columbia's quiet charm and friendly residence. A stroll down Main Street is like a step back in time. Be sure and stop in the office of the Red Wolf Coalition, which is promoting Red Wolf recovery through education, outreach, and research. When it's time for lunch, there are several options, all a little out of the ordinary. One of the best is back at Willie Phillips Full Circle Crab Company. Here, locals and visitors order from Willie's seasonal restaurant, Call of the Wild. Share a picnic table and enjoy a shrimp burger, crab cake sandwich, or scallop kebab. The scenery here is just fine. You might get to watch the watermen unload the day's catch on nearby docks or the workmen sort crabs for shipping or work the shedding tables. Blue crabs are North Carolina's most valuable commercial fishery and the Albemarle Sound accounts for the majority of the landings. Bring your cooler so you can take home some of Willie's homemade crab cakes, shrimp or flounder that he sells in the retail store out front. It doesn't get any fresher or better than this. Consider a drive through the Alligator River Refuge on the way to the Outer Banks. Here, another 152,000 acres have been conserved within the refuge, perhaps best known as a release site for red wolves. You might even be lucky enough to see a red wolf along the quiet stretch of road. The bustling coastal town of Matteo awaits at the end of the drive. Here you'll find lots of local charm, rustic shops, delightful restaurants, and captivating accommodations. One can easily spend the day learning about the area's history or taking in a concert, art show, or play. Perhaps it's fitting that in the place where the Coastal Federation found its beginning, it established its third regional office. While the staff is often in the field, 
Visitors are welcome to drop by the Coastal Federation's Northeastern Regional Office located near downtown Manteo. To complete a tour of the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula, you'll need to gas up and head west on Highway 264. Following the Pamlico Sound, you'll pass through long stretches of marsh, forests, and farmland toward Lake Matamesquite in the center of Hyde County. The region's vast open lands are fringed with large farms, like Lux Farms. Lux Farms is a family-operated farm that produces regionally famous onions, corn, broccoli, and other vegetables. The Coastal Federation is working with owners Wilson and Debbie Daughtry to restore the farm's natural hydrology and to reduce drainage into Pamlico Sound. Our interest in the project originated several years ago when we realized that we, we had a need for a way of storing some of our drainage water that was leaving our property and having the ability to reuse that water in our farming operation. And by not uh, introducing it into the uh, receiving waters of the Pamlico Sound, hopefully improving the water quality issues there. Whether fishing for catfish, hiking a trail, looking for tundra swans, or simply enjoying a scenic drive, the wildlife refuges of the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula offer a variety of ways to experience the wild beauty of these remote areas. It also serves as a reminder of what ordinary people can do to preserve and protect the rich natural resources, history, and traditions of our coast. The marshes of the Albemarle Pamlico Peninsula are indeed magnificent places, but so is this place. Locals and visitors come here for the fine seafood and for the magnificent views of the White Oak River. It is pretty, but what do the folks eating here know about the waters flowing past them? Do they know, for instance, that the water at their feet marks the end of a river's long journey past waving fields of marsh grasses and stately stands of old forests? Along our rapidly developing coast, this river is haven for birds, bears, and other wildlife. It is a marvelous outdoor classroom where our children learn about the natural wonders of our coast. It offers us numerous opportunities to take a break from our hectic lives for a peaceful paddle, a leisurely walk, or reeling in the big one. And its waters teem with life. The river's oyster bars and sheltering wetlands are an important nursery for numerous marine creatures, such as blue crabs, flounder, shrimp, red drum, spot, and clams. The 48 mile long white oak is one of the last relatively unblemished watery jewels of the North Carolina coast. Starting as a trickle in the Hoffman State Forest in Jones County, the predominantly Blackwater River lumbers past the little town of Maysville and through Jones, Carteret, and Onslow counties, gradually widening as it flows past Swansboro and into the Atlantic Ocean. The river drains almost 12,000 acres of estuaries. Saltwater marshes lined with cordgrass, narrow and meandering freshwater swamps, and rare stands of red cedar that are flooded with wind tides. The northern half of the river is largely undeveloped. Much of the land on the east side of the White Oak is protected by the 161,000 acre Croatan National Forest. Land on the other side is mostly privately owned and is used to raise tobacco, cotton, soybeans, and corn. But the White Oak's broad lower reaches have been discovered. The population here has increased by almost a third since 1990, while developed land has increased by 82%. The growth has led to more pollution entering the river. You can see why the river's northern reaches qualify as among America's most scenic and wild rivers. A boat or kayak trip here is like traveling back in time. Few people live up here. No houses mar the river's banks. No honking cars or roar of outboard engines. Just the river's symphony. The water is mostly fresh up here. The alligators like it. They're still a threatened species in North Carolina and here they may outnumber the river's human residents. If you come up here in the summer and are very lucky, you may see this odd creature. The American purple gallinule, or swamp hen, lives in southern Florida and in the tropics, 
but comes north in the summer to raise its young. A good place to begin exploring this section of the river is the Haywood Landing Recreation Area in the Croatan National Forest on NC-58, south of Maysville. Here you can launch your canoe, kayak, or shallow draft boat to explore the river by water. Or you can take a walk or drive through the lush swamp forest along the river bottom. Haywood Landing has a number of walking trails or dirt roads that offer magnificent views of the forest. This is Jeannie Krause, a natural scientist who frequently gives tours in the area. We're near the headwaters of the river, which you notice the water is very black. We call this a black water stream because it originates in peat bogs in the Hoffman Forest. It's very acidic, full of tannic acid. Um, we do have a few freshwater fish up here like brim, but this is totally fresh up here. The only tides we have in this area are wind tides. We have a lot of um, cypress, bald cypress along the river banks, and up a little bit higher we have a variety of oaks, maples, ash, hickories, just a variety of hardwood species. And it's a habitat for um, different birds. We have um, in singing in the background a number of songbirds like warblers, prothonotary warblers. We sometimes hear pileated woodpeckers in here. Um, wood ducks sometimes are on the river. And if you're on the river itself, you might see reptiles and amphibians. And there's one that you see every now and then, and that's an alligator. But it's a beautiful stretch of river. The U.S. Forest Service has protected thousands of acres along the east bank of White Oak. But land near the other side of the river is largely privately owned. It's taken people like George Pat Patrick to preserve its beauty. From 50 years ago up until now, uh, I walked every bit of this land. I hunted, with, hunted on this land with my friends. We tried to keep it clean. We tried to protect it from fires. And uh, over the years, I guess you might say I just sort of fell in love with this place. I was contacted by the Coastal Federation and we decided to put the land along the creek, all of it, into an environmental easement. Because if you look at this marsh out here, you're looking at nature's filter. The water is clean as you can see, and that marsh keeps it clean. Pat and his wife live on this 275 acre tract along Queens Creek near the White Oak. Housing subdivisions push up to their fence line. They didn't want to see houses lining their portion of the creek. The NC Coastal Federation worked with the Patricks to preserve their land. Using grant money from the state's Clean Water Management Trust Fund, the Federation bought an easement that protects a mile of creek front. Using trust fund money, the Federation has worked with a number of people, groups, or institutions to preserve almost 4,000 acres along or near the White Oak. The 1,500 acre Quaternary Tract, the Pelletier property, Morton Farm, Huggins Farm, Jones Island, and Huggins Island. All are now public property and protected from development. The river begins to widen. As it approaches its final destination, the sea, the White Oak meanders, cutting these graceful loops called oxbows through the broad plain. Fresh water gives away to salt water now. The briny sea moves up with each tide, frequently enough at Stella, that saltwater marshes replace the freshwater swamps. North of the Stella Bridge, freshwater plants like cattails and sawgrass dominate. South of the bridge, saltwater species like cordgrass and black needle rush start to appear. The narrow Blackwater River that we saw up at Haywood Landing is now a broad saltwater estuary more than a mile wide in places. Small still creeks course through the marshes to feed the river. Those marshes teem with life and attract a variety of predators in search of a meal. The trails at Cedar Point Recreation Area and the Croatan are an easy hike and offer expansive views of the saltwater marshes of the lower White Oak. 
Well, it's unbelievable that it's the same river with two very different habitats. Down here at Cedar Point, we're near the inlet and near the mouth of the river, so we have brackish water that is from the sea water that comes in through Bogue Inlet as well as down the river, along with the marsh grasses makes a nutrient-rich soup down in here. Um, the tides are, are what bring it in, the lunar tides, which you don't find in the upper reaches of the river. Um, the vegetation down here is mostly salt marsh grasses as well as maritime forests with cedars and maritime live oaks. Um, so it's a very different open grassy habitat. Animal life you find down here is also very different. You find a lot of shorebirds just like the great egret we saw, um, osprey nesting, painted bunnings that I just heard a few minutes ago. Um, and the animal life down in the marshes consists mostly of fiddler crabs, blue crabs, oysters. After your walk, you can pitch a tent or relax by your RV at Cedar Point's full service campground. If you're feeling adventurous, you can launch your kayak or canoe at the boat ramp in the recreation area. Canoes and kayaks are the best way to explore the shallow creeks of the lower river. Like Mike Tangretti, you may find that with a few swishes of a paddle, you're immersed in the river's wild beauty. To me personally, it's just a way for me to wind down after a long day at work. Um, it's just, uh, it's, it's my version of recreation. It's my version of instead of going to the gym, I get to go out onto the river and I get to kayak a little bit. Um, plus I enjoy to fish. So it's something that, um, you know, makes me smile at the end of the day. Mike lives near the river. Kayaking along it has given him an appreciation for its beauty and for the need to protect it. The White Oak River would be worth protecting for the same reason you would want to protect any type of environment. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's an ecosystem that makes a home for not only those who live around the White Oak, but the animals and the fish that live within it. As far as tourism is concerned, you know, it's a big pull for tourism. There's a lot of stuff that you can do on the river other than boating and fishing. Um, kayaking happens to be one that I do. If you don't own a kayak or don't feel comfortable paddling the river on your own, Barrier Island kayaks on the causeway of NC-24 Bridge into Swansboro will rent you one. It also offers group and guided tours of the river and surrounding waters. Hammocks Beach State Park near Swansboro also has an easy kayak launch. From there, you can explore nearby Queens Creek or the quiet marshes that fringe the back of Bear Island, which is part of the park. The park's rangers offer programs that help understand the ecology of this watery landscape, and the displays in its nature center bring the lessons to life. Some people use their kayaks for fishing, but most, like Bill Norris here, fish from boats. Uh, we catch red, uh, red drum, black drum, flounders, trout. Uh, sometimes you'll pick up some croakers and occasional spot and two. Uh, the bluefish will get up here during uh, times when the salinity is really high. Uh, but other than that, that's, that's basically what I, what I try to look for and target. Uh, structures plays a very important part, especially here in the White Oak. Uh, that's where your habitats are going to be. You got food and shelter that the, the structure will provide. And we always try to look for the structures because nine times out of 10, that's where the fish are gonna be. Oyster reefs seem to be everywhere. The birds know what Bill does, that the reefs are a good place to catch a meal. Scientists have counted more than 300 marine creatures that inhabit reefs in North Carolina or are attracted to them to feed. As this time-lapse video shows, oysters also help keep the river healthy by filtering out sediment and nutrients in the water. White Oak was once known for its fat oysters and clams. The river's shellfish were so prized that a century ago, competing watermen came to blows over this bounty at places that now bear such names as Battleground Rock. Rain often brings a welcome relief from heat and drought. But after it washes down our streets and parking lots and rooftops, it becomes a poison to the White Oak. Hundreds of pipes like this one dump that poison into the White Oak laden with sediment, oil byproducts, toxins and bacteria, this runoff is now the largest source of pollution for the river. 
Years of this have taken their toll. Almost two-thirds of the river's clam and oyster beds are now closed to fishing or closed temporarily after a moderate rain. The bacteria levels in the water make the shellfish unsafe to eat. This is Jones Island in the middle of the White Oak. The island remains uninhabited because the North Carolina Coastal Federation and its partners stepped in to save it in 2005 after it had been rezoned for residential development. They acquired much of the island's 26 acres and gave them to Hammocks Beach State Park. Jones Island is really the perfect example, a perfect illustration of why the Coastal Federation is as successful as it is. Because it, it perfectly joins the various programs that we have at the Coastal Federation, advocacy, education, preservation, and it all came together on Jones Island. So it is truly a, a, a really wonderful example of how one program led to another, which led to another, and, and in the end result was that we have preserved a very beautiful island in the middle of the river, and it is now an open classroom where we teach hundreds of people every, every year about this beautiful ecosystem that surrounds this island. Instead, the island is now the center of an ambitious attempt to restore the river's oyster reefs. That's Lexia Weaver, one of the Federation's coastal scientists. She and other Federation staff members are directing the effort to rebuild the oyster reefs around the island. Thousands of volunteers have been working for many months to bag millions of oyster shells in these mesh bags. Uh, the mesh bags are being used to create these um, hundreds of feet of oyster shell bag sill. The shells inside the bags are going to serve as a hard surface for the oyster larvae that are swimming naturally in these waters to attach to. Eventually, this uh, oyster cell is going to be full of oyster shells. Each oyster shell filters about 50 gallons of water per day, so eventually when the cell is covered by oysters, what we're going to get is a large oyster reef with a lot of filtering capability, and this is going to help improve the water quality of the White Oak River. The oyster shell bag seal also creates a lot of habitat for fish, crabs, other invertebrates, and also other shellfish such as mussels and clams. Volunteers like this young lady do most of the work. More than 300 people like her have worked for more than a year on the oyster project. It can be dirty and tiring, but also very rewarding. The beach is awesome. I grew up at the beach. I think any time I get a chance to help, um, this is the first time that I actually heard about it, um, and I definitely volunteered. Um, it's a beautiful day, it's a beautiful place to do something, volunteering. Um, it's a lot of fun. Federation educators Sam Bland and Sarah Phillips also teach visitors to Jones Island about the ecology of our coastal rivers in an education center that the Federation and the park transformed from an old bathhouse. The purpose of the Jones Island Environmental Education and Restoration Center is to provide environmental education and habitat restoration opportunities for the general public and for school groups. This is valuable in that they will be able to be involved in restoration activities such as shoreline restoration, oyster habitat enhancement, and salt marsh restoration. They'll be out here planting marsh grasses, they'll be bagging oyster shells and using those oyster shells to create oyster roots. The Jones Island Center is located out in the middle of the White Oak River that provides a very remote, unique wilderness setting where people can come out here and also enjoy the wildlife out here and experience a coastal fringe evergreen island and hear the sounds of the cicadas and just experience something a little bit different than the nearby barrier islands. About a mile from Jones Island, Jimmy Phillips waits on customers at his fish house on the causeway to Swansboro. Jimmy's family has been selling seafood here for more than 60 years. We started in 1954. My dad and his brother built seafood business. Actually, it was a we built a Swansboro fishing pier and seafood. We started to own our first boat in 1968, our first shrimp boat, which we had small boats that net fished and stuff like that. Swansboro was once a center of commercial fishing along our coast. Its harbor was home to several trawlers like this one, and other fish houses like Jimmy's. His is now the last. 
Yeah. It was a lot more net fishing then. That's basically what it, what it was. A little bit of shrimping. Some well, shrimping was all, it was pretty good in the fit in there too. You know, shrimping inside. A lot more shrimp inside then. Seemed like we were the last one. Yeah. So when you visit Swansboro, come by Nicky's to enjoy a fine meal and to sit by the river. You'll be captivated by its beauty, as all who come here are. And now you'll know its story. Here's another story you should know, the story of one of the greatest conservation victories in North Carolina history. Good morning, kindred spirit. I'm back this morning, watching a spectacular sunrise. I'm walking alone this morning, very, very lonely. But this island is so inviting that it makes negative feelings turn positive. It is such a welcoming friend. August 2004. Bird Island has that kind of effect on people. Once threatened by development, the island was saved after one of the great conservation battles in North Carolina. Thousands of people have since walked its deserted beach and wandered among its lonely sand dunes, finding solitude and solace. Many come here to this odd mailbox in the dunes. They find the dog-eared notebook, and in it they record their most cherished memories, their most personal feelings, their most longing prayers. They've been doing it for more than 20 years. Dear Kindred Spirit, phenomenal. We are visiting for the first time, but it most assuredly will not be the last. To develop such a treasure as this would be a sin. September. 1995. Bird Island is the last in a string of barrier islands that hug the North Carolina coast south of Wilmington. Located between Sunset Beach and Little River, South Carolina, the 1,200-acre island includes about 1,000 acres of marsh and wetlands. A narrow, meandering inlet that dried up with each low tide once separated Bird Island from Sunset. The inlet closed in 1999 following Hurricane Bonnie, joining the two and opening Bird Island to wandering tourists seeking escape. The island is easy to visit on foot and there's a public access from the boardwalk in Sunset Beach. The private owners of Bird Island generally left the place alone. An owner in the 1960s built a wooden causeway across the marsh to his house on the end of the island. The remnants can still be seen in the marsh grass. The island, though, was mostly left to the avian creatures that give it its name. That all changed in 1992 when new owners applied for permits to build a bridge and mile-long causeway from Sunset Beach to a planned housing development and a marina on Bird Island. The stage was now set for an historic fight. Bill Ducker thought so, too. He owns a house on Sunset Beach overlooking the marsh that separates it from Bird Island. He became alarmed when the development plans were announced. But the other thing that, that alarmed me as far as the development was concerned, that a private bridge was going to be built across these public waters behind me. And so that was actually converting public property for private use. And I, got, um, I was concerned about that, that that could actually be done. When I listened to what was going on, that the council did not realize the scope of what they were proposing and what could actually happen if they did in fact follow through with that, with that um, vote to, re, to zone Bird Island agricultural and forestry. And so um, at that point in time, I felt it was my duty to, um, to stand up and point that out. 10 local people gathered in Bill's house in March 1992 to talk about how they could save the island. The group included Minnie Hunt, Sue Weddle, and Frank Neesmith. They began by writing letters and making phone calls. Guided by the NC Coastal Federation and other conservation groups, the advocates formed the Bird Island Preservation Society. They began raising money for the long fight ahead. I think we raised around $25,000 and acquired about 1,400 members which was a pretty sizable, powerful group and big enough certainly to have an impact on the state. They heard our voice. Lauren Collodi is the Deputy Director of the North Carolina Coastal Federation. And the Coastal Federation, we knew we had to help with Bird Island because it, you know, 
for several reasons. One, I mean, it was one of the last, or is one of the last remaining undeveloped barrier islands along our coast. And um, also, we were concerned that if you start, you know, if you allow one bridge across an inlet, what kind of precedent would this set for the way we develop our coast in the future? The Coastal Federation got involved because of the citizens. I mean, that's what we do. When people need our help, we, we make sure that we provide them with the information, the assistance they need so that the state and, and local governments make the right decision or wise decisions about our coast, ones that, that are legally allowed. No one did more to draw attention to Bird Island's possible fate than Frank Neesmith, who spent much of his life walking the island's beaches and exploring its teeming marshes. Minnie Hunt explains the importance of Frank's role. Frank's role on um, the effort to save Bird Island was probably key. Uh, he was the creator of the Kindred Spirit mailbox, and when he found out that we were going to actually get together and try to save this island, Frank was the first one to scream yes, and when we were sitting around trying to figure out how to uh, raise membership, Frank stood up and said, I will do walks, and he did a walk every Wednesday uh, during the summer until we actually saved Bird Island. Amid the growing controversy, Frank invited people to walk with him along the beach he so loved. On some days, a hundred or more took him up on the invitation. The beach walks received nationwide publicity, and Frank was soon dubbed the mayor of Bird Island. Frank fascinates visitors with the natural science of Bird Island and the story of why it was important to save the island. Bird Island is one of the few quiet places remaining along North Carolina's coast and to the first time guest may appear deserted. But in fact, some pretty special creatures live and visit here. Tiny footprints in the sand are common and might belong to any number of birds, several of which are threatened or endangered. More than 260 bird species have been documented on the island and in the maritime scrub shrub habitat. Bird Island is as much a paradise for shell collectors as birders. The ocean waves leave shells scattered along the high tide mark, and many a treasure is hidden among the sea drift or seaweed that floats onto the shore. During the decade-long fight, the effort to save Bird Island garnered headlines across the state. Hundreds of people attended meetings to oppose the development of the island. Hundreds more wrote letters against the development. Finally, in 1996, the state forbade the construction of a bridge to Bird Island. It bought the island six years later. The island is now permanently protected as part of the North Carolina Coastal Reserve. You can fight City Hall, you can win, but the thing about it is that um, hopefully in the end it doesn't become a fight, it becomes a joint venture with City Hall realizing that this is something that should be done. And so, um, but it takes quite a bit of um, perseverance to convince them of that. Very seldom do I ever get over to Bird Island, and I try to get over there about every day, that I don't walk past that sign that says North Carolina Coastal Reserve, that I don't say to myself, thank you to the state of North Carolina for buying it, and thank you, North Carolina Coastal Federation, for the help we got down here in this little place. An anonymous writer went by the mailbox in the dunes soon after the deal to save the island was done and succinctly expressed the feelings of many. Hallelujah. I can't sum it up much better than that unknown writer. That ancient word of rejoicing seems like an appropriate way to end our journey to places made possible by the inspirational work of our fellow North Carolinians. Hallelujah indeed. Since 1982, the North Carolina Coastal Federation has worked with thousands of people to bring about better management of coastal resources. The Coastal Federation is the state's only nonprofit organization focused on protecting and restoring the coast of North Carolina through education, advocacy, and habitat preservation and restoration. The Federation works up and down the state's coast, serving all 20 coastal counties with fully staffed regional offices in Manteo, Ocean, and Wilmington. 
You can help protect and restore North Carolina's coast by joining the Coastal Federation. When you join, you help protect habitat and water quality, restore wetlands and other habitat, advocate for better coastal rules and regulations, promote public access and traditional industry, monitor coastal waters and permit compliance, educate students, decision makers, and the public. To learn more and to join the Coastal Federation, visit www.nccoast.org. Have you ever been in such a bad way? You just had to go somewhere before night turned into day. Like a tractor, you aim your car Through the darkness plow Ain't got a clue where you are But you know what you gotta get to somehow a man easy with his work devoted to his wife till a category five of the inner mind blew away his life she had friends living down there 